So when I first started my filmmaking business, there were certain types of gear that were completely intimidating to me for no reason whatsoever. And after doing some consultation calls with people, helping them get started with their filmmaking business and even talking to some of my friends, they also had a very similar experience like I did. So I figured I'd make a video about eight pieces of gear that I was personally intimidated by that I should have bought way sooner than later. They saved me time, money, they inspired me to take risks in creating more beautiful cinematic images as a DP. And I really wish someone would have just told me, buy this for this reason. So here we are and let's get into it. So the way I'm gonna be structuring this video is I'm gonna start from the most boring piece of gear that might not have been recommended to you all the way to the most exciting, interesting piece of gear that I'll be recommending. I can almost guarantee you, you won't be able to guess what I'll be recommending at the end of the video, but stick around because these recommendations are super helpful. And if you haven't heard about them, they will be saving you time and money on set. So I won't be having specific recommendations throughout the video. I'll be doing that more so towards the end and I'll just be shotgunning them and having the links down below so you can find them yourselves, look for the best price and all of that. So the first thing that intimidated me as a filmmaker that I should have purchased way before I actually did are actually camera cages. And not just camera cages, but rigging equipment in general. Side handles, top handles, different base plates and whatnot. And these are extremely important as a filmmaker, not just because they look cool or make you look more professional, even though that's one of the benefits from a client's perspective, your camera won't just look like a small little mirrorless toy. But camera rigging parts let you add a ton more functionality to your rig. From an obvious standpoint, they let you attach more things to your rig that you might need when you're run and gun and just shooting different things. But one thing I never realized was that it makes your footage way more stable because it adds more weight. I used to think when people said this, they were dumb and I was actually dumb. It really does help. But not only that, when you have different handles on your rig, you're more motivated to get different shots that you frankly just wouldn't even try to get without them. For example, a top handle motivates me to get low angle shots and different shots that I just wouldn't normally get if I didn't have one. A side handle as well, more specifically one that articulates. This is because this helps me hold my camera in a more comfortable position as well as makes my footage way more stable because I have a couple more points of contact. Also, most cinema cameras that were made for filmmaking were specifically created so that you can add different parts to it. Most of them have a box style shape so that you can use specific tools for your specific needs. Rigging up your mirrorless camera so it's more tailored to your needs just adds a little extra oomph and gets you one step closer to an actual filmmaking tool than just a hybrid camera that you can shoot video with. Obviously this doesn't make the image better, but it did inspire me to shoot differently, which changed my composition, made my footage more stable, and made me look more professional in front of clients instead of holding a rinky dinky mirrorless camera. It took me a long time trying different top handles, side handles, base plates, all of that, just to find something that worked specifically for me. Might not be the same case for you, I'm just super picky and meticulous, but I wanted to add that just so you weren't discouraged if you tried building out a rig and it didn't work for you. So the second piece of gear that you should buy sooner than later is a camera monitor. So I thought these were redundant when I first started filmmaking and it was for two specific reasons. The first reason was I use autofocus almost all the time and I didn't think I needed the exposure tools. And the second reason was because I was really dumb as a beginner filmmaker and didn't really know anything. Using a five or seven inch monitor on your camera is almost essential if you're shooting mainly video. Even though I didn't need a bigger screen to nail critical focus, seeing my image blown up on a larger screen while I was shooting, whether it be five or seven inch, made a world of a difference. I was able to compose my shots better. I was more inspired by the images that I was actually creating. And this is because a lot of times I couldn't see the intricate details while I was shooting with just my LCD screen. 
that three inch monitor, you can't see certain things that will affect your framing and composition that you can easily see with an onboard camera monitor. And another super important reason why camera monitors are important is because most, if not all LCD screens are unusable in bright direct sunlight. When I first started, I was shooting a ton of weddings and a lot of them happened at like high noon. So the sun was directly over your face, which means over the LCD screen and the screen on cameras are not bright enough to be able to be seen in direct sunlight. Vice versa, most if not all camera monitors are bright enough to be seen in direct sunlight as long as it's a thousand nits or higher. So you can see how it was really crucial having an onboard camera monitor. So if that's you right now, just go to the description, see whatever monitor I recommend. And I highly suggest you just purchase it and then come back to this video. So the third piece of gear, I actually made an entire video on, which I'll link somewhere, but it's vintage lenses. I wish someone told me to purchase vintage lenses way sooner than I actually did because they changed the whole trajectory of my business. That's not an exaggeration. Buying these $50 manual focus vintage lenses that people were saying, make your footage look so cinematic, forced me as a YouTube learning filmmaker that only shot with autofocus to actually shoot manual focus if I wanted to get the images that I was seeing other people get. So what this did for me is it made me get out of my little autofocus bubble and actually tell a story with how I focus with my camera. This not only made me a better filmmaker and storyteller, but it made me feel more connected to the images that I was actually getting. When I brought it into the computer, I was way more satisfied. That was dope. And happy that I nailed focus and all of these different things. It was more exciting for me. Not only that, it pushed me to create more artistic, cinematic, images as opposed to chasing resolution and the sharpest glass out there. Now it almost irks me when I see people chasing the sharpest lenses and they're only shooting video, but I completely understand because that was me. All in all, vintage lenses inspired me to shoot more for little to no money, so I highly encourage you to give them a try. The next piece of gear that I was intimidated by were filters. I don't necessarily know why, I just didn't wanna worry about putting something else on the front of my lens, but they changed my whole image once I started using them. And more specifically, mist filters. These, when I first started, were not as popular as they are now. They're definitely overused now, but they are 100% necessary if you wanna take the digital edge off of modern glass, let's say the photo lenses that you use or whatever you want. So I had fallen in love with the image coming from vintage lenses, but I still wanted the ability to use autofocus with my photo lenses. So using modern autofocus lenses with a diffusion filter was a compromise for me because I wanted that softer, dreamy image as opposed to the stale, clinically sharp images I was seeing coming out of everyone else's camera. They also helped me recreate some of the looks that I had seen in movies that are flat out impossible without using a filter like this or using a specific vintage lens. And that is because they bloom. As you can see from my phone light, it's super sharp and defined, doesn't have a lot of character. And once I put it behind the diffusion filter, it gives it this bloom effect that I saw in movies that I just wasn't able to recreate. I'll show you from the side angle. It was just a lovely thing that I found out way later than I should have. So the next piece of gear I didn't even know existed until I felt the pain of lugging lights, cameras, different gear, stands, soft boxes, all these different things from my car to location back and forth. And then even when I found out, I didn't buy one until like two years later. I'm actually using it right now and it's this film car right here. I went through many actually and even purchased some really expensive heavy duty ones and I ended up with this one. It helps carry all my stuff. It's collapsible. It doesn't weigh that much at all. And it's relatively sturdy. I added some carpet to it to make it more, I don't know, professional and spray painted these legs black. And that made a world of a difference because I had a central location to put all of my stuff to carry from location 
to location. This film cart helped me not lose as much gear because I had one central location where I could put all of my lenses. If my assistant was taking one of my lenses when I switched it, he would just put it on the film cart, put the cap on, and that was it. It was a lot less work to get all of my things to the actual location. Having all of your gear spread out on set is not really a good look, and having a film cart just looks way more professional to the client. I had originally purchased a $2,000 cart that was more of an industry standard. It was super heavy, extremely sturdy, and looked professional, but it wasn't as maneuverable and versatile as this cart in my opinion. This is an Olympia cart. It was around $170. And although it's not as sturdy as the other cart, which is extremely beneficial and necessary for some use cases, it's super easy to fold and get set up as opposed to the $2,000 cart that I had prior. That one wasn't hard, but this one's just so much easier and lighter and faster than the other one. The other one weighed close to 70 pounds and bringing that down three flights of stairs was just not happening for me. So this was a great alternative. And in my use case, a better option than the $2,000 car. All of these things will be linked below. So if there's anything that interests you, you'll find it there. And before moving on, these videos do take a ton of time and effort to make. So if you are enjoying it, consider subscribing and like the video so YouTube can push it out to other people and they could benefit from it as well. Oh man. So one of the most neglected pieces of gear is a video tripod. And I am emphasizing video because this is a tripod specifically meant for video use. A lot of people buy tripods, but they are photography tripods. And the reason why I highly advise against only having one of those is because this is actually sturdy and you can put heavier cameras like the rig you're gonna build after watching this video. This is the last thing I wanted to invest my money in, but these things last 10, 15, sometimes even 20 years, so your investment will go a long way. Also, this will save you a huge headache and money when your expensive camera falls on your flimsy photography tripod. So just buy one. I know it may suck at first, but it's worth the investment. Also, there's cheap, really good video tripods like the small rig one that just came out. I think it's around like $250, so now you really don't have an excuse unlike I did back in the day. I'm just kidding. I didn't have an excuse then either. I should have just bought one instead of being cheap. But here I am. There's actually a lot more I could say about having tripods and why they're beneficial, but I wanna get on to the next super exciting piece of gear because it's just gonna knock your socks off. I don't think people say that anymore. I sounded like an old man. So the next piece of gear is your computer. You should upgrade this thing sooner than later. And honestly, it's not gonna really cost you that much because computers have been upgrading with cameras. So the new M1 MacBooks, even if you buy a base one, can handle almost anything that you throw at. You could find one used for really, really cheap nowadays. And the other ones that are just coming out can literally handle almost everything that you'll throw at it. Just trust me on this one and save yourself the headache of having a stuttering computer while you're trying to be creative. Something I always adhere to is I try to have the least amount of roadblocks possible while I'm trying to be creative. It's hard enough sometimes to get the juices flowing, but if I have a computer that's stuttering all the time, it's gonna be more frustrating. Honestly, my work is probably not gonna be as good as it could be. So for a couple hundred bucks, upgrading a computer will go a really long way and actually help you in the creative process, not just make your editing faster. The last and one of the most important pieces of gear on this list is an ergonomic office chair. I spent way more time editing than I did shooting and I was editing in a kitchen chair, one of those hard kitchen chairs that really hurt your back. I don't really know how to put it into words properly, but it really helped create a work environment that I actually wanted to go to. The chair I purchased was so comfortable and supported my back so well that I actually preferred to sit in it as opposed to on my couch. So I would go to my chair much more often and I would edit the projects that I needed to edit way sooner 
than procrastinating and waiting to the end and stressing out. This might not seem like a big deal, but starting to cultivate your space as a working professional is extremely important. And me personally, I would say is way more important than half of the gear that you're probably purchasing. For filmmakers, this is definitely one of the most neglected purchases, and I really don't think it should be. I wish I would have purchased an ergonomic office chair way sooner than I actually did. Now for the recommendations, I'm just gonna read off the list, gonna shotgun them all. For rigging up your camera, I would recommend anything from small rig. I've used all the budget options like Tilta, Condor Blue, and all these different things. Small rig, for some reason, every time I use them, they seem to actually think about the filmmaker and they make it easier to use the rigging parts. So I would recommend small rig. Yes, you can go more expensive like Bright Tangerine and Wooden Camera, but I wouldn't recommend those if you're just starting out. Bright Tangerine is amazing though. For a monitor, I would recommend the Atomos Shinobi. It's super small, color accurate. I'm still actually using it right now. And it's just good, it just works. For vintage lenses, that's more of a taste thing. But if you're just starting out, I would recommend the Helios 44 II. It's a really popular Soviet lens. Looks incredible and is really funky. And it'll just give you a feel for vintage lenses if you're just starting out. For filters, more specifically mist filters, I would recommend the Tiffin Black Pro Mist 1 8 or 1 4 or Nissi actually just came out with some Black Pro Mist filters that are actually really good and I've been testing them out and I would recommend those as well. The film cart, I already talked about it, but it's the Olympus cart that has a 300 pound payload and it's incredible. For the tripod, I'd recommend the small rig. I think it's called Free Blazer or something like that. And it's only 250 bucks, so. For computers, I would recommend any M1 or M2 MacBook, but I'd recommend the M1 MacBooks over a PC or anything like that because it's gonna cost you a lot more to get the same specs and performance as the M1s. And now finally, for the almost ridiculous recommendation, but super necessary, the ergonomic office chair I would recommend to you is the Steelcase Leap V2. That's the one that I use. It has really good back support, really comfortable. Everything is really adjustable so that it would fit perfectly to your needs in your back and butt. But yeah, that's all for this video. Those are the eight pieces of gear that I was intimidated by that I wish I would have purchased way sooner than later. If this video was helpful for you, consider subscribing, like the video down below. And I'm actually not just saying this to help the algorithm. Comment down below whatever stories you have of gear that you were intimidated by when you first started. I'd love to get the discussion going and hear your stories and maybe get a laugh out of it. But yeah, that's all. I'll see you in the next one.